very much, Liam. Thank you all for coming, and thanks to the folks who are tuning in. We're really excited because between the people, you know, viewing um, by live stream, we have over 90 people in attendance. So it tells you just, and, and from a very diverse group. So Liam introduced me, but I want to first start off by thanking the Institute for Cyber Science, Penn State Dickinson Law, and Penn State Penn, Penn State Law. Yes, Penn State has two independent law schools. Um, more about that later. Uh, and so, and I also want to say thank the College of Engineering um, and these amazing panelists who are here today. We're going to go over a lot of stuff, but I just want to briefly introduce the panelists and tell you what we're going to try to do today, and then I'll have them give a few words about themselves. Um, and then we're going to kind of have this as a conversation. This is not a typical academic panel where they're just going to each speak for a few minutes. We really kind of somehow lured Ruben into this uh, very kindly. He agreed to talk to us about some exciting conceptual work he's doing, but really at the intersection we'll see with health, privacy, data, data security, system security, um, and the law. So this, while we're going to talk about Ruben's stuff as a highlight, the platform really is this broader discussion um, and to, to point out all the interdisciplinary work that's going on here at Penn State and the opportunity. So first to my right is Ruben Kraft, who is um, a assistant professor with our College of Engineering. He's also um, uh, has a really great background uh, near and dear to my heart because he went to undergrad at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County campus, UMBC, and he got his PhD in Johns Hopkins and since I've lived and worked in Baltimore for a very long time. Uh, and Ruben also has a really has, is having a great week because besides working constantly with ICS, um, Ruben, Ruben was awarded the uh, alumni's outstanding um, award for teaching um, from Penn State alumni. So really, um, and to, to Ruben's right is Rachel Herder. Rachel has a PhD and a JD from the University of Minnesota. Her PhD is in molecular biology, um, and so. Rachel has worked for years with one of the largest patent firms in the world, so she brings to Penn State in her position as the director of our intellectual property clinic incredible resource and value. And more importantly, for all of you researchers and folks developing apps out there, the services of the intellectual property clinic are free. <laughs> sitting next to, and that's not something you hear lawyers say often. <laughs> um, and so sitting next to Rachel, we have Ryan Gilmore. We're really grateful to ICS because Ryan is going to talk to us a lot about how ICS, the Institute for Cyber Science, works to keep our researchers' data secure and kind of handles the compliance and a lot of things about data. Uh, Ryan is his the title is um, technical director for ICS, correct? Yeah. And so Ryan is near, of course, as many people come back to Penn State, it's a big family. Ryan has his um, undergraduate degree in electrical engineering, right? from Penn State, and he also has a um, master's degree in electrical engineering. No, systems engineering. Systems engineering from George Mason. So, and then last but not least, who we're really honored to have here today is Tom, even though his tag says Thomas Charval. Do not call him Tom. It'll take him back to nuns yelling at him as a small child. So, let's just stick with Tom. So, Tom Charval is the former managing partner of Morgan Lewis, an incredibly large firm. Tom brings an excellence in corporate Backgrounds, corporate transactions, and he is the director of our Entrepreneur Assistance Clinic here at Penn State, which is located in Launchbox. Both uh, Professor Herder and Professor Shawbos uh, practices are located in Launchbox, and they are both professors at Penn State Law. So you really have this combination of two law schools here: um, Institute for Cyber Science and the College of Engineering. So, and special thanks to Liam Jackson who stood up here and embarrassed himself. But Liam said, "I put this together." Make no mistake, Liam and his team of folks really did all the work to make this happen today, and Jenny Evans really has given us a ton of support from her position as director of ICS. So I'm just, before I get started, um, I'm just going to ask everybody, each panelist, to say a couple words, and if I could, Ruben, I'll start with you. Sure, yeah. Uh, well, first, thanks Anne and Liam and ICS uh, and all the panel members for uh, inviting me to be part of this. It's really exciting. I've, I've been learning stuff as we've been planning for it, and I'm sure I'll learn a lot today, too. Um, my background, I. I heard graduated from Hopkins. I went to work at the Army Research Lab for four years in Aberdeen, Maryland, Aberdeen Proving Ground, Maryland, and there I got exposed to sort of computational biomechanics and brain mechanics, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, more in a second. Um, and then I worked at the Applied Physics Lab at Johns Hopkins for a year, and then I came here in 2013 as an ICS co-hire, um, and I use ICS resources you know, daily. 
Um, the, the course that I got the teaching award, I actually use, I have 100 students from residents and also World Campus on ICS learning, high performance computing. Uh, we use that system every day, so it's, uh, I really thank them also for those resources. Um, and I've been here t since 2013. Hi, uh, my name's Rachel. I um, was working at a big law firm before, um, working on patents um, and patent prosecution, so helping early stage startup clients um, get and build their patent portfolio. Now I direct the Intellectual Property Clinic, which as Ann mentioned, we provide free legal services to any small Pennsylvania uh, company or individual. So I, intellectual property generally refers to like patents, copyrights, trademarks, and trade secrets, and we can help you. So I hope to see some of you come visit me. No question is too big or too small. Um, if we aren't in a position to be able to help you, I can definitely help point you in the right direction. So uh, I really look forward to seeing some of you in the future. I'm Ryan Gilmore. I support the Institute for Cyber Science. Um, I've been supporting ICS for about three years now. I just stepped into the uh, technical director role in, um, I guess it was August. Um, prior to that, I spent about nine years with a federal contractor working on uh, systems engineering and a little bit in compliance and security as well um, there. My focus um, here has been primarily in the security and compliance and also with the systems engineering approaches of ICS in particular. Um, so we're going to use a lot of acronyms, so I'll just get it out of the way right off, off the bat here. It's ICS, the Institute for Cyber Science, the uh, uh, system that we support is, the, is referred to as ACI, or ICS-ACI, the Advanced Cyber Infrastructure. So from here on, I'll we'll refer to it as ICS-ACI. That's the instrument that I support that um, you know, we are the flagship HPC for the university. And just uh, for the non-technical people, sorry to interrupt you, HPC is high-powered computing systems. So many of you, I'm sure, know that, but some yeah. of the I, I, I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> so, there I go again. I, I swear that I think you can speak complete sentences of acronyms anymore. So, you know, if, if, if anybody has any questions, please stop me. If I use an acronym you're not aware of, stop me and I'll, I'll try to, you know, spell it out. Um, so we have uh, 20,000 compute cores roughly, and um, we have about 20 petabytes of storage, both active and archive storage that, that we provide for our research. Um, one thing I want to make very clear right off the bat is um, I do not perform the research, right? We have researchers here. We like to think of ourselves as enabling that research to advance, to foster an interdisciplinary um, research endeavor at the university, and that's where ICS ACI fits in. Okay, <clears throat> um, I'm Tom Sharbaugh, and I have um, been back here at Penn State for I guess this is my third year. I, I grew up not far from here, over in Cambria County, which is in Evansburg, which is that place that has the big courthouse that you see on the hill when you drive to Pittsburgh on Route 22. And uh, so I, I went to law school, and then uh, went to Philadelphia, where I was for decades. Uh, with a huge law firm there doing uh, a variety of business uh, work. And then um, I uh, had the idea to, to start teaching um, and uh, proposed to the law school here that we start an entrepreneurship uh, program here. And uh, it's one of the few things I've timed exactly right in my life. Uh, it was just around the time when uh, President Barron started this whole Invent Penn State thing. And so I, I, I made the pitch to the, the then dean and, and associate dean of the law school, and they were interested. But it was before um, Eric Barron did his thing. And then uh, two weeks later, he told every college in the university they had to really get involved in, in entrepreneurship. And I got a quick call and said, you want to do this? I was like, done. Uh, so here I am. And uh, so my, my office, as with Rachel, um, is down at the lunchbox downtown, not at the law school. And we spend a lot of time, we have all sorts of clients coming from, we started off representing clients from right around the area here, uh, the university community broadly defined, and it sort of went out to adjoining counties. Uh, but now, just after a few years, and particularly after the, the addition of uh, uh, Rachel's capability, uh, we now represent uh, any, any client uh, based in Pennsylvania. So there we have clients that are in professor teams at Bucknell and Lehigh and, and students at Wilkes College and up at Kutztown, I mean, all over the place. 
And uh, it, it's really been great. And, and I, I always uh, say that we're, we're like the modern day land grant outreach part. You know, it's like, used to be you had guys in trucks driving around handing out different types of corn seed to try. And I still remember this as a kid, Herb turned up driving through town. Uh, and that's like us now. Uh, you know, we are you know, out telling people all over the state uh, how they can uh, develop businesses. Thank you. Thanks, Pamela. So just uh, one of the, the, the way we're going to do this, a few housekeeping rules, is we're going to have plenty of time for Q&A after. You know, we've got a good window of time to do this panel. Um, and we're going to sort of hear the story of Ruben's work. And, you know, we had a joke going beforehand about Ruben was like, what happens when, like, an engineer goes in the room with three, like, privacy and data layers? Do they come out in handcuffs? Um, <laughs> we're not going to let that happen today. Um, and Tom and, Rachel make sure, yeah, <laughs> Tom and Rachel will make sure that doesn't happen when you do that. And this is why this is so important. And what Ruben's doing is so, you know, he's really, it's great foresight in the work he's doing because, one, societal benefit of the work he's doing cannot be, uh, it just can't be emphasized enough how important the work he's doing is. But at the same time, it really proposes very novel questions about both data storage, wh what's being done, compliance from that standpoint, and how does a researcher take, take this kind of work and get it to the market? Really, how do, how do we get it out of the research? How do we protect the intellectual property of the researcher? How do we make sure that the researcher is using trusted data and the research he or she is doing, um, protecting that property, and then that commercialization process? So uh, I'm, I'm really, again, these four panels are to do that. But let's think about this again as one of the primary goals here is for us all to recognize the benefits that come from interdisciplinary collaboration. Even though I've been practicing electronic surveillance and privacy law for decades now, just in the process of preparing for this panel, I learned so much from each of these individuals. So I hope today that that's our goal. So Ruben, if you're ready, let's get started with your, sure. with your work. Yeah, so um, the sort of the use case that we're talking about here is um, brain simulations and, and brain injury. And that's really the one of the focal points of my research portfolio. Um, so if you don't know, uh, concussions are one of the most significant health and wellness issues impacting young people who play sports and serve in the military today. A lot of my research focuses on trying to understand that and, um, and you'll see actually model that process so that we can develop other technologies to protect or improve the, the, the welfare of folks. Um, and I thought, you know, I thought it was really useful to actually mention this. Um, so I thought that I'd dedicate my panel uh, discussion today to Dylan Thomas and his family. So Dylan uh, was a, a football player who actually died on September uh, 30th, uh, 2018. Um, and you can see here the, the coroner released the statement uh, that his death was ruled an accident and uh, he had cardiac arrest as a result of traumatic uh, brain injury um, due to a closed head injury. So um, I think this, this is a very real problem uh, and it's actually it's a very, uh, it's, a, it's a hard little situation we're in because uh, we have instances like this um, and that are, that are really sad and there are lots of other ones like this. At the same time, we have this love of sport uh, that we love to do and, um, and so it's, it's, it's very tricky navigating this. Um, so that's, that's who uh, I want to yeah, I think keep them. It really keeps it in mind, and I yeah. think what's interesting is the statistic because it's not just about football. That's right. That's right. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I have some numbers on that. So, to give you a little bit more in-depth uh, numbers, uh, each year in the U.S., an estimated 2.5 million people, grades 9 through 12, experience concussion. Okay, it represents represents 15 percent of all high school students, and this doesn't include include all the millions of younger kids who suffer concussions. Two in 10 high school athletes who play contact sports, including soccer and lacrosse, will suffer concussion. So this is not a football problem, okay? Um, I, uh, I was a very big athlete, and I, I suffered concussions, and I didn't play football. Uh, girls soccer sees the second most concussions of all high school sports, um, and uh, as well as girls basketball sees the third most, and we're starting to see some very interesting differences between men and women uh, in the way they experience concussion. And Athletes who have had a concussion may be four to six times more likely to experience a second concussion. So it's essentially the, the tissue or, or something about that system is more vulnerable after you have one. And that's an issue that we have to understand. 
So this is also not just a civilian problem, it's a military problem. That's really what got me into this first part. So it affects soldiers in both peace and war. Um, and you can see that this chart here is a number uh, released by the DOD. They track these since 2000. And over 380,000 soldiers have experienced a traumatic brain injury. And this large slice of the pie here, over 82%, is what we call mild. So a mild traumatic brain injury is synonymous with a concussion. Many times people use that term interchangeably. Uh, so we have a large number of mild traumatic brain injuries. And it's so much that every conflict, if you look back at the history books, they ha tend to have signature injuries. And concussions or mild traumatic brain injury has been classified as the signature injury for Iraq and Afghanistan, the, the last uh, conflicts we've been in. And of course, this has big implications on not only war, but now there's a very large research focus on uh, what we call, um, you know, basically occupational exposure. So this is in the training field, either for like SWAT teams in the civilian side or military folks. These are folks that, you know, you work with explosives and practice this on a daily basis. They're exposed to low level blast over pressure, so it's a pressure that impacts your head. And the worry is that, um, well, the worry is what's the effects long term? This is a big problem for the military because if there are long term neuroregenerative effects that are associated with this operational uh, loading, uh, we're talking about VA benefits and all of those things that follow. So it's a big monetary cost in our society that we have to think about also. It's just not that window of time where they experience negative cognitive symptoms. Okay, so the other thing that many people don't realize is that there's no gold uh, standard for diagnosing concussion. So this is, it's very hard to do. You cannot see this right now on a, on a like a MRI, a magnetic resonance image. We hope that there are techniques that can get us there, but we're not there yet. Um, if you talk to people diagnosing, uh, medical physicians who diagnose concussions, they are using different techniques to do that. Um, you know, some range from Eye tracking, for example, is a popular one. Uh, there's balance, there's a reaction test. There's a lot of these, uh, these neurocognitive uh, tests that they can do to assess and, and try to make that diagnosis. But it is very tricky to do, and there's no litmus test that you could take to do this. One litmus test to do this. So this leads us to um, the idea of sensing. So one of the ideas is, well, what if you know a threshold at which you get a concussion? What if you can sense that somehow, and then just connect those dots? So you got you got in, you got, you had an impact in soccer uh, that you experienced, uh, and it was this level. That means you have a concussion. Time to sit out or go through a, a a rehabilitation training phase or whatever it might be. The doctor might prescribe. So these are these are a couple companies that that I work with. Um, there are ones that are focused on blast loading, which is very unique from a, a soccer uh, impact. Um, in terms of an explosion shock wave. And then there are ones that are focused on sports. I have a couple of these examples. Um, two of the examples in the middle. So there's one sensor from Athlete Intelligence. And they really, uh, I would say, were one of the first companies to really pioneer what, what we call the mouth guard sensor. So uh, this is a sensor that you put in the mouth guard. So it's traditional, people are used to wearing mouth guards. And so they put it on the mouth guard, which is really uh, a great thing in the sense that it's the best method to capture kinematics of the skull. So the best we could do from sensors, and these are sensors are the same ones that are in your cell phones. They're accelerometers, gyroscopes, things like this. The best that we can do is measure what the skull does with these sensors. And so the tighter, tighter uh, coupling we have with the skull, the better information we get. We have seen scientific studies that have shown, you know, uh, there are cases where they put inserts in the helmet, there are headbands, uh, there are even like stick-on patches that, I, that I've seen. Um, and the, the problem, some of the issues they have to work out is that, 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 when, that when you have an impact, your tissue or the apparatus which you're measuring moves separately than your skull. So they're right, not so we can see like if the girl, the soccer ball gets hit on that thing, the headband might move That's independent right. of the right. skull. And they've done high-speed high imagery to see this and, and a lot of studies. So um, the mouth guards are really exciting. I'm going to pass these around. So this is the vector mouth guard, and you can see all the sensors sit outside the mouth, okay? And uh, let, let, me, let me see this real quick. So um, that's one of the first models. One of the companies that we're also working with, um, which I'm, I'm really excited about, 
um, is a company called Prevent Biometrics, and it comes out of the Cleveland Clinic, uh, a researcher, the director of the Head and Neck Institute there. And this is like a mouth guard that you see, if you, it's, it's opaque, so you can't really see through it. Um, and you can even see the hole in the top where you, if you remember from your sports, you sort of put it in the boiling water and form it to your mouth and to your teeth. So this is the same thing, you put it in the hot water. It turns out, I'll send the second example around, that it's actually embedded are all these sensors inside. And so there's a lot of testing going on with this, this mouth guard here. So, so one thing I thought was cool though is, as an athlete, which would you prefer? Right, think about that. Right, do you want this thing sticking out like, looks good, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, so um, that's, uh, that's one of the technologies you have to, and the athletes don't really know that it's even there. And that, by the way, that, that sends data to the cloud. The athletes should know it's there. Let's just... Right. <laughs> right. No, in, they in don't the sense that, it's there. Yeah, in, in the sense that it feels different from different mouth guard. Um, it, it, it's not like the, the tab case or uh, other cases that you might have, the headband, for example. Okay, so just to, and I know you're going to get to this, but just to be clear, so what does that mean when we talk about data and reliability of data and trusted data? What is the difference in these types of sensors? Maybe talk about, address that, because I think that's pretty fascinating. Yeah, well, well I should say I'm, I'm not a, a sensor guy. I'm not an expert at that. Um, but there are problems as, you know, this, this work is not new. I mean, this work on biomechanical sensors has been uh, going on for at least 20 years and um, figuring out how to use it. And you know when they started to go and commercialize this, there was um, there's pushback. And the reason not every athlete is wearing them right now because the medical community hasn't accepted it. Um, it's not F as far as I know, none of these devices are FDA approved, um, and they have real challenges. For example, if you drop your sensor and it sends a signal off, that's a false positive that then is held forever in the cloud, basically. And so, what do you do with that? So. I might be able to get into this, but there was all these issues about people wearing Fitbits on military bases. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we'll talk about that. Yeah. Drama. Yeah, yeah. yeah, of course, yeah, and so what, how do you hold the data, how is it secure, and all those issues yeah. are definitely around uh, all I'll give a little story, I'll tell that story. Yeah, so the, the reliability of the data has been uh, definitely a challenge. I'm hoping that the, the all the batteries and the sensors now internal to the body, tightly coupled, will help solve that problem. And uh, we continue to, to work on it. I think the, the sensor companies continue to work on this. Thanks. So if we have the, 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 the data, what we are thinking is uh, the sensor data could be really useful. At best, um, let, me, let me actually come back to this a second. Let me say one other thing here. So this is a little little movie that shows how the brain moves separately than the skull. So of course this is not real, this is a, a synthetic brain and, and, and skull, and of course the top of the head is chopped off. But it shows an example of these nonlinear materials and how complex they are. Do you think the lawyers needed to be told it wasn't real? <laughs> well, I don't, I'm not sure, just, just making sure. Uh, again, I'm trying to avoid the handcuffs here. Um, so. Uh, you can see, it's easy to see, that the brain is, is, behaves very, very differently from what we call a mechanical response. It behaves very differently from what the skull is doing. And so it's a real problem. At best, we said we could collect data on the skull from a sensor. We can't, unless we put sensors internal to the body, we can't, we can't do that. So the skull is the best thing we can get. And so we said, well, what if we could use data from wearable sensors at the skull, trusted by mechanical data, to predict the brain's response. And that's kind of where it enters into the modeling phase. Uh, and, and that's really the entry point for that. And so the, the basic idea is that um, we have sensor data down there, what we call the dose. So you think about this as a, a you know, just similar to um, a prescription and, and the amount that you take. This is the, the impact or blast dose that the sensor can accurately measure. Let's assume that's there. We know that the brain re responds differently from the skull. And so what we have to do is we have a huge question mark between what we call functional outcomes. And that's, those are the symptoms associated with a concussion. You're dizzy, you can't balance, you have headaches, you can't sleep. So these are the, all the symptoms and there are many different ones and they're, many, they're very complex for individuals, but we can't create that connection yet. It hasn't been able to do. So the one thing is, well, if we need to know the brain response, can we actually use modeling to predict, predict tissue stretch. And tissue stretch is a, it's a biomechanical thing. It's, it's, it's 
what we do as mechanical engineers and material engineers is we, we model these systems and we can validate these models. And so the jiggling brain was the tissue stretch. That's right, that's a tissue stretch. And that, this connection between the sensor, data that's reliable, and the tissue stretch is achievable uh, through biomechanical simulation, validation, and all the work that's associated with that. It doesn't touch on what we call quote unquote soft issues, on how your functional, your mind is working. It's only mechanical properties. Okay, so um, that's where we, we want to do, and, and, and the goal really then is to use computer brain modeling to drastically improve the way neurotrauma is detected and monitored over time. So imagine if in the future we could use the sensor data, we could run a simulation of the brain, and then we could tell the physician or the medical doctor what happened inside, almost like a virtual MRI. Okay, and, and that's kind of uh, the statement there. Um, let me show you a little bit about what is this computer modeling. If you're not familiar with that, let me tell you a little bit about that. So computer modeling is, is, a, is uh, and specifically what I use, is called the finite element method. It's a, around, it started back um, you know, a long time, around the 1900s, the mathematics started to form, and then uh, you know, we first applied it really in aircraft design and how wings flutter. I teach both undergraduate and graduate level classes here um, and uh, uh, to engineering students, and it's really the go-to tool in engineering. You can see here, we use it for you know, connecting rods, we use it for crash simulations, um, and uh, we're starting to use it now in biology. It's so powerful, for example, back in the 1990s, the 777 Boeing air, airliner was entirely designed in the computer. Okay, so this is not a this is not a uh, a video game. It's based on real physics uh, that are accepted laws, and it's a trustable, reliable method. So we've started to use this. The most advanced, what we call computational medicine, I would say, is really uh, what the virtual heart. And this is a a, a couple of folks who have been leading this. They're really ahead in terms of modeling. Um, and the idea is if you're having like a, a valve replacement or something, they would go in and actually design a model of your system, of your heart, and see if they're, what they're going to implant or transplant is going to be effective, okay? And so there's, that's starting to be used in the clinic, which is really exciting. And that really, I think it really spawned off my, my, my ideas in brain modeling because we're not, you know, I've been doing brain modeling for 10 years. It's been around for at least 30 years and it's not in the clinic yet. It's not being used by physicians. And you know, I wonder from my research perspective, you know, my day to day, you know, is this making an impact on people's lives as it should be or it could be? And so a lot of you know, this moving forward is exploring, can we do that? Uh, and you might want to think about that for your own research. Uh, you know, is it transitioning as fast as you'd like it to transition? Um, here are some of the models you know, we work on uh, now. These are template models of all the anatomical regions. They include the major anatomy, um, and we can develop these computational models from that. Here are other examples I developed when I was at the Army Research Lab. You can kind of see the internal response of the brain. You can kind of see it's so that almost a virtual MRI machine that was run. Um, and, and here you can see the, the nonlinear response of the brain in real time during an impact. Uh, and so that kind of shows you the, the power of the method and where it could go. Um, just one more thing on the modeling. Um, here is, uh, see if it works. This is just a, a little movie that shows the computational uh, method. Here again, we, you can see that it's a, it's a soldier. A lot of my, I mentioned a lot of my research is focused on, on military. Um, and we have a lot of the components of the skull, the, the brain. Um, and this is all created in this digital space of finite elements. Um, and you'll see here that it's just not a, a surface mesh. It actually holds three-dimensional volume that which we solve partial differential equations over. Um, this, this model can run um, in about, uh, if I remember correctly, about a day. It's about 24 hours on 16 processors. Um, and so ICS enables that capability through parallel computing. So I think one thing, too, for the audience as we're seeing this is it really is, and the living heart example that Ruben talked about is this is 
the frontier of medicine because we think about it, there's a, a company in Europe that's working on body double, right? And the idea is to create a virtual duplicate. And so in that living heart project, what they do is using scans, they can actually take the patient and do a virtual model of their heart so that the surgery can be done on the virtual model to make sure that all unique attributes of that person's heart or vascular system are being accommodated and are being taken into account before the surgery takes place. And when we think about what we want, isn't it like think about how many, how many, you know, Ruben, you and I talked about this, how many um, industries um, use computational modeling to, as you pointed out, the, the Boeing aircraft to build something before they actually build it. And they use modeling to do that. Or to see what is the consequence of this is gonna be? How are we going to um, really measure this? So I think that's what's really phenomenal here is to see this happening with the brain. We'll talk about the scary parts of it in a minute. Though. Yeah, yeah. Uh, go ahead. Um, <laughs> yeah, thank you, Ruben. Okay, so, so how could it work with all these things we've talked about? So um, this is sort of a, a a picture, a schematic of, of concepts at this point. Everything is a concept. So let's say we, we develop a computerized, uh, individual-specific model of an athlete uh, and their brain, and uh, we're able to predict brain deformation and monitor cumulative insults over time. And so you might start down here as a, a youth player, and you might have these sensors collecting data, and they upload that to the cloud, and then this use person might get older as they, they their career evolves and they go to teenager or college and then finally adult. Um, and all that data is still stored in the cloud. And so what we're proposing is that possibly for every impact that occurs, there could be an automatic simulation that spawns off. So you have an impact, it takes data to the cloud, automatically we create a simulation of that particular impact for that particular individual, and then that data is post-processed and sent back to uh, the player, the coach, the physician in this case, um, and we monitor this over time. This could be important for things like uh, neurodegenerative neuro disease where we, um, we, we can't really test, um, we have no way to identify if that exists during life. So most of, you know, if you've heard of tr chronic traumatic encephalopathy, that's still uh, uh, sort of, um, being researched, but that's possibly associated with impacts uh, to the head, repetitive impact over the head. So could we actually predict that in real time over life? I think this is super interesting, this next slide here. Yeah, so... So, so think back to that, so youth, teenager, college, adult. Right, and let me tell you, so let me sort of, how big is this problem, or how could a big of a data problem could it be? So this is a, this is um, data collected from the athlete intelligence, that's the black sensor I sent around before, um, this is collected over two seasons. So the first activity you see is 2015, and then over here on this side is 2016. So there are two seasons of play that occurred. The data is so dense that if we took a, that dashed line up there and we zoom in here, this is just for one day. Okay, you can see over one practice all the impacts that occurred. Um, and so using this data, we estimate from a, this is high school football, there's about 500 impacts per player per season. Okay, if you use the data out there, there's about a 1 million uh, high school football players today. Um, so that translates to about, and if we did a simulation on each one of those impacts, it would be 500 million simulations uh, per season. Uh, per season. So I, I would argue, and this is only for football, I would argue that this concept of digital brain simulation uh, could be the pinnacle of, of digital healthcare, uh, computational personalized medicine. Yes, we're using it in heart studies, but it's not at the frequency at which this would occur. We're talking about multiple simulations per day. Um, and so that's pretty exciting. I mean, I think about it from a data, data perspective. I think about it from a uh, data analytics perspective, all that data that would be there. Um, and it's just, uh, it's just really amazing um, to think about how big, how, how much data we could actually have there. So, well, um, okay. This is so sort of how it works. Before, yeah. yeah, so I know that you, that's your wrap-up slide. So from the lawyer standpoint, and this is talking about the cyber and data privacy pieces of it, and this is where we kind of thought I would jump in and talk about this for a second. Um, so think back to, we saw these examples of how the sensors are working and the biometric data that's being collected. 
right? And so understand the critical importance for accuracy of this data. We see these sensor companies are collecting this data. And the, this, this chart shows us just how much data is being collected on an individual, right, over time, taken down to a day. And now think how important the accuracy of the data that's being collected by the sensor is. Because what are the long-term implications for that, and short-term? Right? If someone's reviewing the data, a coach is reviewing the data and saying, hey, you've got too many impacts, you can't go back in. What if it's from a drop of this? What if I just drop this on the ground? Right? So these questions about data are really important for a lawyer because the things we think about from the cyber and data perspective, and this is the kind of thing that really matters for researchers. When Ruben is working with these companies that are collecting these data, lawyers would ask these questions first, and this will tie into what Rachel and Tom are going to talk about in a minute from the intellectual property standpoint as well as the commercialization standpoint. It is really important that researchers understand how the data they're using is being collected. If you're working with NIH data, part of the genomics cohort, you're fine, right? You know that those people have consented to the collection of the data. So when we look at this, again, it's the researcher needs to know how is the data being collected and what's this important thing from the legal standpoint. When we look at this, somebody could argue that there is human testing that's going on here, right? We're collecting data about impacts. It's just an argument, not saying this is, and again, this is all conceptual. But when we look at this, the question becomes, did that individual consent? What about when you have a minor child whose data is being collected with these sensors? What is the long-term implications of this data? Can an employer 20 years from now go, give me your information? Can a health insurance company say that? These are the kinds of questions that we have to answer now from an interdisciplinary approach. Because it takes both the law, the scientist, the patent attorney, and the person who's handling this data, keeping this data secure, right? And making sure that the data itself is trusted and accurate. So again, these overview of questions that we'll keep coming back to is, how is the data being collected, right? Where are you sourcing the data from that you're using in the research? Um, and and, and so, so is there consent? And where's the data being stored? Are you storing data that has certain compliance requirements under the law, right? Is it, is, do, you, do you have to comply with the National Institutes of Health's compliance requirements? Ryan's gonna talk to us about that in a few minutes. And then how long is the data stored? Who owns the data? If this is the student athlete's life now, of brain data, who owns it? And the US and Europe differ completely on the answer to that question. And all of you, this goes back to something Jenny, cool. so let me, let me ask that next question. Who owns the data and then who can access the data? Right? So these are these really pressing questions as we use human health data. Ruben is doing really cutting edge stuff, but every single person in this room who's walking around with a Fitbit has consented to contractually data being collected about them that can be used for human testing purposes. That is what your terms of use for your Fitbit says. Jenny Evans, the ICS director, mentioned the Strava story. For some of you who don't know that, Strava is basically Facebook for athletes. It is a mobile app that is synced with your wearable device. Really great, really high performance um, app. Strava, um, sitting around, you know, this great app company, like, wouldn't it be great if we collected data, we used heat, heat sensing data, publicly available data, from satellite imagery. Yeah, that's great, because then our, we can show our athletes heat maps and look at how many Strava athletes are using this. Pentagon officials thought it was so great to incentivize soldiers to stay in shape that they supplied wearable devices and apps to thousands and thousands of soldiers in active combat. So a, an engineering student, I think he's an engineering student, right? Um, Nathan Rooser looks at the Strava heat map and realizes he can identify U.S. special ops bases in Mogadishu, Djibouti, uh, that there's no public record of and no one should know. So the interesting thing, New York Times, if you've never seen this, has a great little two-minute video on the Strava app story. So think about what happened there. The lack of interdisciplinary communication. Military, Pentagon, incentivizing soldiers to stay in shape. Really good intent. Strava. We want to, one, make money off of people, but we also want to incentivize athletes, right? And we want to make this platform. Not only that Strava, because it's like Facebook for athletes, you could put posts up. So things like the camp perimeter base run. And so think from a standpoint of special ops and security. You knew exactly when the soldiers were patrolling the base, when the soldiers were exercising, because they're wearing the Fitbit all the time. So the data is being collected about them constantly. So when we think about that, who owns that data? And think about the merger of data sources that is all part of our life now. 
So turning back from the standpoint of um, Ruben's um, uh, aspects, when he's working with these sensor companies, it's perfectly appropriate for a researcher who is either developing a mobile app to make sure from a contractual standpoint that he or she, whoever, what, however is working on this app development, is in fact making sure that terms of use and privacy policies clearly get consent from the person who's going to be wearing the device or using it. From the standpoint of a researcher who's gathering data from outside sources, right? you're trying to make sure about compliance, which I'll turn to um, Ryan in a few minutes about. And, and then you're trying to make sure that it's appropriate for you to say, hey, I need to make sure you have consent of the data you're sending me. Because right? we're getting data on individual, we're getting individual health data. And so you have a right as a researcher when you're sourcing data and you're working with outside vendors to make sure that that piece is addressed. So we're going to let you finish up with that. Yeah, so um, this is just a, a conceptual idea about how we would work. And I've kind of already said this, but basically through that picture, but basically sensor companies would have their own, they have their own software platforms um, and they, they, uh, they run on different clients. Clients could be laptops, mobile phones, or tablets. That data is collected from the sideline. It goes up to the cloud. The software companies could get a, a finite modeling API, uh, which would basically you know, give, us, give them access to some server. Um, and they would get a library of generic brain images that, that I'll explain in a second. When the impact occurs, the sensor company calls the API and sends measured accelerations and impact location to the cloud. Once it comes onto a cloud uh, server, then the fine element model would use the sensor data as input and compute the area of the brain with the highest strain. And there are a lot of other measures we can look at, but I'll just talk about strain. Another term for strain is stretch. So where did the tissue stretch the most? Um, the fine element model then um, sends a, a short text message based on the output, say such as like cerebellum or corpus callosum, whatever region was affected the most and the sensor company would get that text message and be able to show in their platform back to the physician or whatever it might be um, the region of the brain that was was um, affected so that that of course could be done for you know all of these impacts in one day and and that can add up to quite a quite a bit of simulations and that can all be superimposed and, and cumulative effects can be explored um, so that's kind of the um, the data um, that, that we've been doing, the process we've been thinking about. Yeah, thanks, Ruben. So I, I think this is like, I, I just want to thank you for that. I mean, that's not going to interrupt the panel and collapse, but uh, it's just impressive. And so, how do we as Penn State make sure that Ruben <coughs> is doing everything he needs to from a compliance standpoint in terms of systems and where and how this data is going and what's happening with it? How do we make sure Ruben's intellectual property is being protected? And how do we help Ruben, as a university, get this to the marketplace? How do we commercialize it? So I'm just going to... Let me say one more thing. So in, sure. in terms of compliance, so, and I do want to disclose that the company has been formed uh, through Penn State. So it's called Digital Brain Technologies. And I work with Tom's office to do this. And I'm going through all the conflict of interest and all of these other meetings. And it's been really amazing. There are, if you go through that process, um, there's tremendous staff, and I meet with Rachel, I think next week or the week after, talk about IP. I've worked with the IP office and the tech transfer folks. Um, so there's like really great resources for the researcher side to explore this. And um, that process has been great, but I did want to disclose that. Yeah, um, thank you, thank you. The lawyers like disclosures. Um, <laughs> so Ryan, do you want to tell us, like, Ruben's already talked a little bit about how, how ICS and HPC, those high-powered computing systems, are making this possible. You want to just kind of give us the architecture of ICS, the considerations that go into this, like clients? Sure, sure. So, um, again, thanks, Ruben. That, uh, I thought that was really wonderful. And it's actually really great, um, and despite this sound a little cheesy here, uh, it, it makes me proud sitting up here that, you know, ICS can support um, research endeavors such as this, right? And I do want to just point out that for, you know, Ru Ruben's one example and the research that he documented here is great. Um, ICS, I ACI as a whole supports somewhere in the neighborhood, I think of 3,000 users across the university, um, which is which is great. Um, I, <clears throat> it wouldn't be right of me not to mention uh, two, two teams in particular that ICS has. We, so, Organizationally, we have several teams, and all the teams together make ICS-ACI really what it is. 
but there's two in particular that I want to call out. The first is the client engagement team. The client engagement team typically will be, or as a researcher, will be your first interaction with ICS. Unless you're talking with Jenny, it's typically going to be the client engagement team. Um, most of you probably know Derek Leidig, for example. It's that team that really works with the researcher to try to identify you know, which allocation makes sense for a particular user, right? How much do you need? That, that sort of thing, right? And when you say allocation, just for the non-tech people like, com the Compute audience. allocation. How many cores do I need? How much storage like do I need power, at right? the highest level? Yes. Yeah. Um, and then the other team that I think is equally as critical is our advanced technical services team. And this team is made up of wonderful individuals with uh, many different skill sets that can work directly with the researcher. I'm not even going to get attempt to get into everything that they do and offer the researcher, but at the highest level, they can sit down and they can work with the researcher to, hey, how can I get my code to, to perform optimally on this HPC high performance computing, and from now on it'll be HPC. Um, how can I get the code to perform on this HPC environment, right? We offer those services. Um, um, some, some services you pay for, so other services, depending on the amount of time, it, it might also be included with your initial sign-up. Um, but I'm not here to discuss that. But those are really the, the two outward-facing um, entities within ICS, okay? So, and and so I say that, and, and I'm the infrastructure guy, right? I'm the technical director. And, and I'm here to tell you, I'm not saying what I don't do is, is not important, it, it absolutely is, but our mission, again, I can't highlight this enough, is the researcher, right? It's to push that, that ball forward on the research environment, right? We provide that instrument, and so, you know, it's great that we can enable this, and, you know, that's where, you know, I kind of come in, but... But, yeah, I'm sorry. So you're yeah, no, question. that's what I was going to say. So you're, you you explain these team, teams, and you've got you you've identified three thousand users, and you're talking across ten different colleges, and we've got all kinds of different research going on. So you've got some pretty diverse data sets. Yep. How does ICS take that into account? So it, it's interesting. So if I can take you on a journey, when I started here in 2015, just real quick, um, there the university well, we didn't have 8095. That's the um, the uh, standard that OIS, or the Office of Information Security, has point uh, just published, I think, last year, and that we all need to be in compliance with. Um, AD 95 did not exist. Um, we didn't have one centralized template that we could use. So, for example, when I came in, we had uh, researchers that had NIH, National Institutes of Health data. Um, they refer the Office of Sponsored Programs referred to it as. Uh, DB gap data, which I think is just a database that stores uh, genomics data, right? And, and, and among other data types. But it's not really a data type, it's a database. But they came to me and said, okay, listen, you know, here's seven or eight uh, controls that we need to meet um, for DB gap. And then um, we might have a researcher that has a um, uh, federal acquisition regulation, and I'm sure the lawyers probably are thinking, quit talking about regulations. I'll do that. But uh, basically, any researcher that was dealing with the Department of Defense, they would have this uh, regulation applied to their grant or their contract. And it basically, at that time, would say, hey, you need to be um, NIS 800-53. And I'm not, I'm not going to get into all of that. The bottom line here is I didn't have one template to work off of, right? So every time a researcher came in, and, and I can imagine the annoyance to the researcher, every time the researcher came in, I had to run through the process again and say, okay, yeah, we meet these, and here's how we meet them. So what we really tried to do, and I, I say we because it was a team effort, it was not just myself. We, we sat down and, and decided we need a template, right? And actually the government kind of made this a little bit easier on us because, you know, as we started to go forward with this, um, they came out with NIST 800-171, which is a subset in that, of It's the National Institutes of Science and Technology. Yeah, and so we use that because that kind of, um, it kind of it was a little bit broader, and we could actually map, because I took it upon myself to map the controls from NIH, map the controls from export, export control data, ITAR, um, into NIST. And once we had that one central template, it made it a lot easier. Um, I could sell off controls much quicker. Uh, we could basically make the case that I don't have to keep selling them off. So if someone such as Ruben comes and says, hey, I need a system that's compliant, well, we've already done it, right? I don't have to run through it again. And, and we were able to kind of standardize on that. And it took a lot of effort. I mean, I work with the Office of Information Security. I work with the Office of Sponsored Programs. 
Um, and I didn't even mention internal audit. We were doing an internal audit in parallel to all this, and they had a totally different template at that time, right? So it, it really, we've made a lot of progress, you know, and I'll, I'll throw a, a shout out here to OIS as well. We, we, I think collectively, we have made a lot of progress at this university from just a compliance standpoint, and I hope, I really hope, to make it easier for the researcher, um, particularly, um, you know, like, again, like Ruben, um, the university has created something called a, a, an authority to operate. Okay, now this is something when I came in, this is um, DOD speak, by the way. That's what all their systems on the DOD side have. They have authority to operate. When I came in, they're also known as ATOs. When I came in and said, hey, we need some ATO-like thing. Right? We need an ATO like document, something we can sign off on and say, okay, everybody's in agreement, right? I'm not selling off my requirements to myself, because uh, that was the other thing I want to hit on real, just briefly is, you know, I got handed a piece of paper and all I had to do was check each one of those boxes and say we were compliant. To me, that's not compliance. To me, compliance is I can check those boxes and then show you how I did it, right? And you don't have to be super technical. Right? When I sold off requirements to the government, I never sold them off to anybody that was more technical than myself. Right? They were always three levels or four levels above me. And so that's what we attempted to do on, within ICS. So working with OIS, you know, we created this ATO <coughs> process, we got the ATO, um, we validated our requirements. I, I have over 600 requirements right now on our system. Uh, over 150 of them are security related. And last December, we went through each and every single one of those requirements and sold them off. And when I say we sold them off, we sold them off to OIS. I, I believe there was a representative from OSP there, and I made sure that there was a representative from internal audit there. That way we can all kind of share in the responsibility of, not only do I meet them, we actually ran, we, we really ran through them. And we had documented test procedures, keystroke by keystroke, basically. This is what we're doing, and this is how we're selling it off, and this is what it means to you. And can I just say one quick thing? Yes, please. So Ryan's talked in great detail about federal government requirements on security around data, and there's lots of different requirements, if it's defense or health or whatever. Um, he and his team delivered those federal requirements complete and on time, and were one of about three or four major universities to do it in the country. In state rules. <laughs> yeah, and to just understand from the standpoint, because it gets it's, get, it's getting technical, a little technical here, but besides leading the way and getting this done first, what does that mean for Penn State researchers? It puts you in a standpoint of compliance. And so as we get lost a little in the tech speak and numbers going everywhere, um, the, the, the point of it is just you as researchers are being presented with a um, HPC systems that are compliant for the requirements that you have to have to get a grant, right? And that is a critical part of it. You are contractually representing when you take data from a source outside that you're in compliance with those like, just maybe like just to simply call them cybersecurity requirements if you want, but the systems requirements. ICS is serving that function. And so part of the detail of this is not to be okay, let's get into the weeds of how this really happens, but understanding whether you are working again with health data, NIH data, these different types of things, ICS has built, has built the compliance piece into it. And it's not that lawyers, when we say, compliance is both a technical and a legal function, right? You can't be compliant in a, from a legal standpoint unless, as Ryan says, I can show you how we are actually technically compliant. So it's not just checking a box. The systems are, in fact, compliant. That's a huge relief and weight off the shoulders of researchers because it's one of the most Byzantine areas of, you know, you get this thing and to submit a grant, you've got to, you know, you're just trying to get your thing done. You're trying to get your research done. So taking that on is a huge role. So I, I, can I make one more point? Sure. I'm sorry. I should probably let. Yeah, we got we got time. But, so I'm going to move um, you along, Ryan. I just want to make one more point, and that point is and I don't think I did a good job of doing this earlier, is that the challenge I put out to the team throughout all of this over the last couple of years is I firmly believe that security, as a security and compliance person, right, that my job in this, this university is to be as transparent as possible, to provide this most secure environment that I can, but to be the most transparent as possible. That's to say that Ruben, how, how often have I talked to you? Uh, I'm not sure. That's the point, <laughs> yeah. right? 
I don't, I shouldn't be on the phone every day with Ruben or Ruben calling me and saying, I, I can't get stuff done. What are you guys doing there? Right? And that's the point. I, we shouldn't be, it's like a referee or an umpire in a baseball game, right? I got to call balls and strikes when it comes down to it. And OIS does. But I shouldn't be dictating the trajectory that Ruben is taking, right? I have to enable him to do his work. He shouldn't know that I'm there, right? And I just want to make that point. And hopefully, uh, hopefully that's coming across. And, you know, by the way, I will offer to anybody listening or online, if, if it's not, you know, we, we can have a conversation too, right? right. It's a two-way right. street. So. Right. And that's why you've got those two different teams. So yep. You've got the client engagement team. So thank you very much, Ryan. So a lot of what Ruben is talking about here is conceptual. And he keeps saying the word conceptual. Um, for a host of reasons, um, but one of them is when we think about what's going on. This is a development process. How how is Penn State and how is Ruben going to protect this intellectual property? So, Rachel, can you just kind of give us a quick overview when we say intellectual property, and then sure. what do you see here? Yeah. So, um, when we say intellectual property, the four main types that we usually talk about are patents, copyrights trademarks and trade secrets. And all of them could apply potentially to a company like the one that Ruben's proposing. So trademarks are pretty easy, so I'll get them out of the way. That's just your brand name, right? We all know we all know what Nike shoes are versus Louis, Louis Vuitton shoes, right? They, they mean different things, and we know that because of a brand. Um, then we think about copyright. So you might think, oh, uh, a copyright usually protects paintings and movies, right? But I bet that um, the software can be protected by, by copyright. Um, any, um, if you were to have any blog posts, guest blog posts on your company's website, those would be protected by copyright. If you were to use any images of, uh, of people playing sports or using your device, those would be protected by copyright. Um, so it's important to make sure that you, you protect both your own copyright and avoid infringing on the rights of others. Because when we think about property rights, we want to think about how we can protect what's ours and how we can avoid trespassing. Um, then with respect to patents, um, there's a lot of ways that you might protect a product or a service with patents. So um, if you have a new method of uh, measuring, so your method is 80% uh, more accurate, it's 5% more accurate. If you've created a new device, so you've uniquely put the sensors inside the mouth, well, the, I know you didn't make those muffers, but the company that put the sensors inside the mouth they did that for a, a useful reason. Maybe it was annoying to athletes' lips to have that thing sticking out of the mouth. Maybe, maybe having it, the sensors inside the mouth actually makes it more accurate. That's another thing that you could patent. Finally, I want to mention trade secrets because that's the secret sauce. That's the thing that you keep secret that um, can make your company successful. So certainly companies' financial records are kept trade secret. I think that's not the important part of the discussion today. But also some very important things are kept trade secret. So the Google algorithm or algorithms, those are definitely trade secrets. Um, these large databases, you have access to them. These companies protect them as a trade secret, and they've given you probably access for the, the purposes that you want. And then data that the company collects, that can be held as a trade secret. So those would be the types of issues I would explore with a client when they came to me. I also like to point out, because when we think about property, we want to think both how we can protect it and how we can avoid <coughs> infringing on the rights of others or trespassing. Um, I always try to talk through, you know, where did you obtain this data? Did these people uh, give you permission to use it? You know, you wouldn't just go out to the parking lot and start driving a car, right? <laughs> if you said, can I drive that car? I'd be like, who owns it? Um, and so I think you want to make sure you, it sounds silly when we talk about a car, but um, I think you want to have the same mindset when we think about data. So does that kind of go back to that or these questions I'm saying that have to be asked by the researcher? Where was the data sourced from? You can't build, and I'm going to let you say this because you will say it far more better, and it's really your, you know, area. If 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 someone is taking data and using human health data for which there wasn't consent mm -hmm. from the subjects, yeah. what does that mean from an intellectual property standpoint? Right. So we have some actually some examples. So um, we're doing a lot of new stuff in this room, but we also remember we've been collecting large amounts of human data for a while. So the the human genome was sequenced, you know, almost 20 years ago. And that's a large amount of, of health data. And so we have some lessons that we've learned in the fields of genetics about people who took information without people's consent. There's a great book called The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. 
um, back at the time when Ms. Lax um, went into the hospital with cervical cancer. Um, the doctors did not think it was important at that time to tell her that she had cancer or to keep her cells after they removed it from her. Um, and, then, and students have used HeLa cells. I'm sure if any of you took a biology lab in freshman biology, you used HeLa cells probably uh, to look at under the microscope. So i just like to point that out is back in the day, it, you know, those researchers didn't think they were doing anything wrong because they didn't think about it. So I invite you to kind of think about the data that you're collecting and how we might think about it differently 20 or 50 or 70 years from now. All right. So thank you. Um, and, and again, you guys can ask questions of individual people, but Tom, it, and I know you've talked to Ruben, you know, you're dealing with um, researchers, inventors all the time. What is this process of commercialization? <clears throat> well, um, let's assume that uh, the uh, let's call them the founders uh, of, a, of a company have some idea that's protectable uh, as a patent for, for now. Uh, there are lots of, of companies that you know, there's no IP at all. I mean, they just do things and, and there's no IP. But uh, in a university setting, there are, are um, unique situations. Uh, well, not necessarily unique, but it, it is different in the sense you have so many people trying to invent things all the time. And in almost all cases, the university owns the IP. So, uh, and people are frequently, you know, professors, are, when they come to us, um, are often shocked when I say, well, where did this idea come from? Where would you work on it? And I say, oh, in my lab, working on the team, and I said, well, University probably owns this. Like I said, no, no, I, I, I invented this. I, 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 I developed this. I said, well, perhaps, but it's still the university. And that person's shocked at that. And but that's the way it is with uh, is rational is better than I do. Almost every employer, uh, whenever you go work anywhere, they have everybody sign a form that says if you invent something there, it belongs to the employer. And in most cases, the employer is paying you to do something. So at least to me, it makes sense that the employer is paying you to do something. That, that the uh, employer would then own the fruits of, of your labor, so to speak. So here at the university, it, let's just uh, focus in on people who work at the university. And, and we do work for, like I said, anybody all over Pennsylvania. But within the university, if somebody invents something, the usual process is uh, th there's a, a procedure where they go to the Office of Technology Management and they say, hey, we have something here uh, that we've invented. Um, the, the office evaluates it, and they decide if it's something that they, it's sort of like going fishing, whether they want to keep the fish or not. Yeah, They decide whether they want to pursue development uh, of that idea or not, uh, protection of that idea. And if they do, they, 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 they take on uh, hiring patent lawyers to process uh, uh, the protection with, with the uh, patent and trademark office and so on, and they pay the fees up front to, to do all that stuff, because it is their property. Uh, and, and then, in most cases, the university will try to license out uh, that technology. Uh, and for many years, most universities license their technology to anybody who wanted to take it. Often there were big companies, uh, big drug companies or uh, other institutions that would license technology and pay royalties back. Uh, probably about 10 years ago, all of a sudden lights went off and, and universities realized that they could make a lot more money if they could, as they say, spin out uh, companies by uh, licensing their technology to a, a new company. And then if that company turned out to be successful, the university would have a huge return. And one of the biggest returns uh, that's always cited in this is the University of Florida with Gatorade. Um, it was invented there, and the university had a license on it, and, and um, they got equity and, and they made, it, made a lot of money from that. So here at Penn State, they, they used to have a, a fairly standard license. This, this past year they've been trying to change the license somewhat, but it usually breaks down where uh, the university gets a royalty on revenue that comes in and uh, from, from the, the IP, you know, use of the IP in, in a product or service. And the university also gets a, a small equity stake. And it, it varies what the percentage is, but it's, it's usually you know, like under 10 percent. It's a non-voting interest, and so it's just there. It's sort of like a lottery ticket. If this thing takes off later and it's sold or they go public or something like that, the university gets out its lottery ticket and says, "Glad we have this," and, and they get a huge return. 
And so, as you would expect, the, the, the university has big research departments, you know, MIT and Johns Hopkins and so on. They, they lead the league in this. They've been doing really well. Uh, Penn State, although it always ranks very high in the uh, total research uh, expenditures, uh, it has not done well with this commercialization. And this was like pre-President uh, Barron, and, and this is uh, obviously a huge focus of his, and it underlies this whole launch box effort and, and, and so on. And it's you know all over the university you know, trying to, to promote this. So what we do um, at, at the uh, legal clinic is, is we meet with the um, uh, inventors and we represent them. We don't represent the university, even, even though the university pays our salaries. We, we represent the um, inventors and we you know, help them set up a new company and we divide the equity um, of the company um, among the owners. If there are uh, several, uh, we help them with uh, compensation arrangements, often you want to have vesting for ownership stakes because you don't want to give somebody 25% of the company and then have that person get a fellowship and move to Germany the next year and they've still got their 25%. So we, we work out those details um, with, for the arrangements among the owners. So we, we form the companies, um, work out these intercompany, excuse me, inter-owner uh, agreements and then help them also with service agreements, supply agreements, when they hire uh, companies to do prototypes or maybe even manufacturing in, in some cases. So that's basically what we do. Could I add one thing? Yes. Please. Actually, um, so just so you guys know, if the university technology transfer elects not to pursue your patent yes. application, by law, if it was government-funded research, it's supposed to go back to the inventor to, um, to pursue on their own. So um, that, just so you know, if, if that were to happen to you, you it doesn't, it's not like the the university saying no doesn't mean that you can't pursue it on your own. One, one interesting statistic in, in that, like, I, the Brookings Institute did this huge study about five years ago of university re research, and it, it really pushed this idea that, that universities should use startups as an outlet for um, getting a return on their technology. And so in this survey that they did of, of university technology, uh, they estimated that, that 74% uh, of all ideas that were presented um, back to uh, all usable, or I guess they call them uh, uh, subject to commercialization, 74% of them were, as they say, left on the cutting room floor. The, the universities never got around to licensing them out to anybody. So there was just this treasure trove of ideas sitting there that, that constituted over a majority of the useful ideas that were invented. I can tell you about my situation. So for me, um, I submitted an invention disclosure on uh, software, and um, I worked with the tech uh, transfer team and met with them, and um, it was decided that at that point, they didn't want to pursue a patent. It might be uh, too challenging maybe to do that, because it costs a lot of money apparently to pursue these things. So then we, it goes to the next level, which is maybe like a, a copyright. And so that's kind of where like this, this system is right now. Is, is we're going through that evaluation process to see what that looks like. But they've been really, really helpful. Yeah. So I um, and also if any of you are going through the process, like Ruben is, you know, the Office of Technology Management is great. They also represent Penn State's interests, not the interests of your company. So if you want um, a guide to kind of help walk you through the process, Tom and I can represent your company and kind of give you our, your company side perspective. Right. So I think that's important just to remember. Um, to have someone who's an advocate on your behalf. So, any questions from the from the audience? Jenny. So, if Penn State owns the IP, and I, as an inventor, don't get anything, how does that work? Why should I tell Penn State? Or I guess I should tell Penn State, but. Why should I be motivated to do it? Where are the handcuffs? <laughs> <laughs> I said I should tell Penn State, yeah, yeah, but why should I be motivated? Well, you're, you're contractually required. No, no, why should I be motivated to do it in the first place? Well, why not just take my kids to the football? Um, well, maybe you make tenure or whatever. Yeah. Uh, apart from that, um, you, you get a share of the, of the royalties that come back. Okay. Uh, and there's like a, a formula where your department gets some, you get some, and the university generally gets some. That wasn't clear before. Yeah. So, okay, yeah, yes. 
So let's say a company uh, gave me a hundred thousand dollars to develop some peer technology. I hired some students, postdocs to work on this. So who owned this? You know, the university or the company or both or I suspect it depends on the contract. Yeah, it depends on the contract. Uh, so in the absence of a contract, the, the person who thought of the invention and reduced it to practice did it, um, is the owner. They're the inventor, for example, of a patent. But uh, you should be going through um, the university office to maybe get a sponsored research agreement. So often large companies will, say, pay the salary of a few postdocs in exchange for this. In those instances, usually, um, it's very clear, you know, if the company and the postdoc invent together, this happens. Um, if, you know, if, if the company invents separately, it belongs to the company. If the postdocs invent, then that's what the contract says. So I don't want to give a blanket statement because every contract is different. Yes, and the gray jacket. Um, uh, this privacy issue strikes me as being very interesting, so intellectually, but also practically. Um, so it's something like Ruben's very cool sounding project. Uh, there's going to be compliance with current regulations, but you just know those are going to be insufficient for this sort of new type of work. The regulations are going to be shifted continuously. Now, I don't quite understand how we as an institution deal with that setting where you're trying to make that Ruben's got to follow somebody for 20 years. The regulations are going to be different 20 years from what they are now. How do we as an institution handle that? You need advice on compliance now, what's required now. And I have to say, my experience so far has been that Often, if people are going to take a job, they still don't know how to do that. It's been very frustrating to me on that sort of thing. But that's even with just the regulations we have now. How do we handle this very fast evolving regulatory environment? I mean, do we have people who try to predict where it's going to go? Is that what you? So think? yeah. So one thing, um, both uh, law schools, particularly, we've got the IP clinic and, and and things like that. But in terms of the privacy. Um, the law is changing rapidly, you make this point, and one thing in the US that is very unique and is not occurring in Europe is that we have these 50 states that also can pass laws that are impacting your research. So California right now is like chart leading the charge, and of course then of course being sued by Google and Facebook because they're trying to bring data into more alliance with the GDPR, right? That general data protection regulation in Europe. And as a gross oversimplification, the whole point of the GDPR is that you own your data. Your data is your property. And so you have the right to be forgotten and you have control over that. So from the standpoint of what is the university doing, I do, I do have to say it was kind of surprising to me the university did not have a general counsel's office until a few, several years ago um, for an institution this large. But I know that like the CISO's office Don Welch, I think, was just here a little bit ago, has made tremendous strides in trying to be very clear about requirements. I see us from the standpoint of what is in compliance with data when it goes onto the system. Because those, right, if we're talking about health data, this is a, we've got a whole different scenario of how we're um, handling this from a legal standpoint. For the researcher who acts in good faith, though, and is making sure of these questions, what's the data that you're using and where is it coming from? That's part of your first question don't get in trouble with the data you're using or the data you're collecting. How are you collecting it? And, and the university's office, right now in the US, very fortunately, if somebody has, has designed a mobile app to collect health data, and I'm using health data not from the standpoint of HIPAA, but data that relates to human health indicators, now let's call it that, um, they have to make sure that they're contra they have contractual consent, right? That the user has said, I know you're collecting this and I understand that. Even Facebook has gotten in huge trouble because you know, in 2013 they did psychological manipulation experiments with their data feed, and they got in huge trouble with the FTC. But so they just tweaked their privacy policy because there was an argumentation, and it was Cornell researchers who were doing this, and and the Cornell's review board approved it. But yet it, it clearly was human subject testing from one side of the aisle. Um, so I think for the researchers, what do you do? Right now, again, law schools everywhere are trying to get up to speed with this. Um, both law schools, and Dickinson I know, has like a certificate in cyber law compliance. I know, um, you know, the things that are happening with Sh Tom Sharbel and Rachel Herter, those clinics, they're out there. So Tom and I have had several phone calls about, hey, I've got somebody who's come in and here's his or her, this, this researcher's app, and here's what it wants to do. How do I make sure that this researcher isn't violating privacy law? And that's a conversation that we have had. In, in fairness, usually the way that it works is for those of you who read Penn State today, 
uh, you know, they have all these things, good things that happen and they announce every day. And so frequently there are clients of ours in there that do things. So <laughs> Anne reads this. I think Tim Brooks here. <laughs> and, and thinks, oh my goodness. You know, and then she sends me an email. You're talking to these people, aren't you? Yeah, so I usually don't catch it. She I was watching out for the person. I was like, oh my god, did you see when they're trying to collect in this? Somebody make sure that they've gotten all involved. And, and really, that's the, you know, that, okay, we won't, yeah, we'll go on to say we did an exercise about it in my cyberlock class that day. Um, but that is this, you know, that's, I, I think that's the, the question is, law is trying to come up to speed with it. You as a researcher can go to the university and say, this is what I'm doing and I need assistance. That, that is why the general counsel's office is there and that's why the law school is here. Because we're doing all kinds of interdisciplinary collaboration. Ruben reached out to me with a question about this. That's kind of how ICS connected us to begin with. We're both co-hires. But Ruben was like, hey, I'm doing this. Do you think that's a... But is our, is our first point of call the general counsel's office? Yes, unless you want to engage, though, in... Uh, so one thing I will say is I just finished developing a uh, cyber law course for the NSA. It was really fascinating because it came from a proposal from IST, ARL, and law. And they proposed a collection of courses. And the NSA was like, we only want the law course and the IST course. We don't want the ARL courses, right? So, but we all kept working together. What was really fascinating, though, is that the NSA's point was we need the law piece of that. And as a result, the folks in ARL and the folks at IST, we all collaborated and that made that possible and we're seeing that push because as you're saying, how do we keep abreast of this? So interdisciplinary collaboration is, is the way. If a researcher, like and I, researchers reach out to me directly, somebody wanted to say, hey, I'm trying to get a grant from Cisco and it's really to do predictive analytics on employees who are at risk for potential theft. And I was like, okay, what are you doing and what do you need? And that researcher's needs were so complex they really needed like to have general counsel's office full on board. That wasn't a, hey, here's how we can come up with a proposal, because really they needed like significant legal protection. So I think that reaching out, knowing the resources that are there, both here at Penn State Law, in at Dickinson Law, and, and these are both, there's the, not just my say, NSA and cyber law, but this is really very industry um, dynamic. Um, you know, the, like KPMG reaches out to law and says, can you come do a presentation with us for the SMEAL grads? Because we're talking about business and everything keeps coming up as, call it compliance if you want, call it cyber law, it doesn't really matter. They're trying to figure out like, how do we keep abreast of these laws that are changing so rapidly? And you know, California, every, like think how many Pennsylvania, I mean California residents Penn State has as students. And so what does that mean? The university's gotta comply with California law. So, yeah, I, I think that, um, can I say something? Yeah. That, um, I think all the mechanisms uh, for protecting and doing the right thing are here at the university, from, from my experience. But I do think we could do a better job, and I don't know who this comes from, from reaching out, like you said, to the researchers. Because you know, now we have like the launch box, and we have all these student startups, and we have faculty doing this stuff. I mean, and so it's you can get the data so quickly nowadays that sometimes you don't you stop need a reminder to, to stop to think. So yeah. I think we could use something. I don't know what that might look like, but um, well, I think that's why ICS did this co-hire. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, they were like, oh, okay, we, this is a critical need. And so that's part of why we're like, okay, then we're, we're going to put resources into doing this, into doing these kinds of sessions, right? And, and you know, usually think how many panels there are. This was just, th this went out pretty quickly. It was really recently started to be, and, and you know, 95 people. And so we have folks from Hershey, we have folks from all over that are paying attention. Yeah, do you have a question? Yeah, so the university seems to be doing a great job of taking some of the financial risk out of the investigator's hands. But for planning purposes, how much time does this add to the process? I mean, for researchers, we just want to get data, work with it, and do useful things. And what should we be planning for if we're going to do this the right way? So I think everyone could answer that. But one one thing to think about at the outset is, right? You know, Ryan talked about checking the box. If you're going to be using ICS's systems. You know, are you aware of what you need to know? Are you putting PII on the university servers? Because Don Watch would be here, but he would have sweaty palms at that point if he heard that, right? So I think from a time standpoint, this is just part of the process. Usually grant proposals, in fact, require it. They demand that you show compliance, both technical and legal, right? That you're not going to take or use data in violation of the law. 
So I think that's already part of the process. We just don't stop and think about it as from the research side until you talk to us and you're like, oh, and it's, it's not, you're already doing it. You just need, you know, we all need to work together to do it a little more from an interdisciplinary standpoint. So the phone call, I think for Ruben, it was a, hey, you need to be connected with Tom Sharbaugh. You need to be connected with Rachel Herder. And I think that got the ball rolling pretty quickly for you. Yeah, and I think, I think, I mean, I, if you're a researcher, you're, you're probably familiar with the IRB. Maybe they don't reach out enough either. But the IRB process, that should right. be, they should have a seat here too, I think, because, I mean, they're, they're really, before I started talking with the law folks, that's the people that I was working with. And they approve and, and they help you through that data. And then that process is, uh, um, so I can, I can tell you a little bit about my experience. I had an idea I wanted to do. I wanted to use human data. And so I emailed them and then they sent back this form and I had to fill out. And it was a long form and then they had to go through, but there was a couple of iterations, but it was online and that was pretty quick and helpful. Um, and you, from that, you get a document that, that participants would sign, or I'm sure they have other ways to get people to consent. But um, that's a really important, very important process in the research uh, sphere. Tom, you were going to say something too? Well, I was just going to say, uh, frequently, in terms of the commercialization side, um, the, the uh, people who invent uh, particular uh, service or product they are not going to run the company. Um, and that's the way it is almost all over the place. I mean, there's a question of time, and there's a question of talent. I mean, frequently, you know, the people who invent something in a, in a lab are not the people who are going to manage a, a workforce. So uh, the university has a, a, an active recruitment um, program where they, they, frequently there are people who have run companies who uh, maybe have just sold a company and they're not doing anything in particular right now. And so the, I can think of a number of cases where they've um, encouraged the startup team to hire somebody and the CEO to then run the company to try to get up and running. And, and frequently, at this point, the company has no cash. So what you need is, is somebody who can come in, nurse the company along in exchange for uh, equity. So they get you know a certain percentage of the company that vests upon certain milestones. Uh, and that's, that's the way most universities handle that. Okay. So, Tim, I saw you had your hand up. Well, I, just, I just wanted to, to sort of tie some of these together. The, there's this big question that I think is still floating out there that's if we want to start something that maybe has some legal implications, who do we talk to? Like, who's our first contact? Because, uh, I mean, I, I go through the IRB for everything, and they have no idea about legal compliance, yeah, for the most mm -hmm. part. Right. right. I mean, I can talk to the technical people, and they have some ideas. Some of the compliance issues, so, but not all. So, like, who's, right who's now, here, here's, here's, so, we have Launchbox, we have Tom Trouble, the commercialization piece of it, we have Rachel Herter for the intellectual property piece of it, I do the cyber and privacy piece of it. The two law schools, even though they're two separate law schools, I have worked now with these two for a long time, and always do so. That's not an issue or conflict at all. Um, Jenny, you have you finish. Oh, yeah, so I, I think that knowing, do you have a project that could benefit from insight of law? Are you doing something pursuant to a grant, or is this something you're just doing on your own? Are you trying to get money from different institutes for this project? If you say, hey, let me involve law at the outset, just to get a, let's run this by, I know, I know everybody is very interested in collaboration. That's the point. And not to say we want to come in and take over your idea. We want to give you the support that you need to get better funding so that they know that this isn't happening in the dark. Because in many universities, including what was going on here for a long time, and it wasn't you know, lack of whatever, it's just happening really fast. People didn't have that opportunity or assurance. There are, I'm pretty sure there's no major research institutions in the world that have two law schools. In the end. Oh, you had to know that fact. Jeez. That's what you get when you have the managing partner of Morgan Lewis here. Uh, one thing, just for our listeners who might not be familiar, IRB stands for Institutional Review Board, and they're a party that would uh, approve of your subject research. So I think, Tim, just to be fair, like it's not like we, anybody wants to be inundated with random phone calls, but reaching out to the university's general counsel's office to say I'm doing this is an appropriate step, reaching out to the faculty in the law school who, who, who do this area or who deal with your specific thing. I mean, I, again, I think that ICS kept me here for that reason. Like that was why they're like, we're 
instead. To be fair, my experience was exactly the same way, though. I'm just, yeah, I'm getting bounced from here to there. I said, oh, who is that person? And, right. and the, the people that draw up the papers don't work with the conflict of interest people. Hey, once you them. started working with the three of us, then yeah, 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 no. yeah. <laughs> I'm, good, I'm good now, but. I, I think what, where, where the gap is, is up to um, Office of Technology Management, so-called OTM. When you get to that point, we actually have an, an idea that's crystallized. You said, I got it. They have been very effective then in saying, okay, go see this person, go see this person. It's before that, we would have no idea what you're doing. I was going to say, oh, you, you reach OTM, though, for anybody who hasn't done this, you reach OTM when you have something that you've reduced to practice. Yeah. So you've done it, and now you're moving forward with it. Right? Yeah, so you, you, can you can be gathering data for 10 years right. before you actually come and say, got it. I think that's the thing we're trying to talk about, though, is yeah. doing it at the outset. Because I think, Tim, that's your experience. Yeah. Like, right? You're like, oh, okay, what did I just do? Right? Like, not, not that was exactly what happened, but... No, but I mean, frequently then you reach out to counsel and counsel says, maybe. Um, because they don't want to commit themselves to something that... I've never heard a lawyer say, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I have a lot of people, and I encourage you to make an appointment with my clinic. I have a lot of people that are not ready to, like, reduce something to practice, but just kind of want to bounce some ideas off, and I try to kind of guide them. You know, don't disclose it publicly if you want to file a patent on it. Don't disclose it publicly if you want to file a patent on it. Um, but other, you know, it's it's good to talk to us, especially because we're free. Um, we can kind of help, um, you know, put some framework around what you might be doing early in the process. And I think Tom and I are very good at referring out to like, if you come talk to me about Tom or Ann stuff, I will be like, go to those people, you know. And they'll not say that. I mean, I'm t I'll be like, I I'm not a patent attorney. Like, Rachel and Office of Technology Management um, sends people to me, and I send people to them, and and so yeah. My experience has been that uh, so far on the, the commercialization, the IP side thing, that's actually relatively well worked out. I'm guessing the frustration you're talking about is that in what sounds like what you've had, IRB is driving decisions about privacy, about storage of information, and consenting and stuff. And it's not obvious to me that IRB has that overview to get it all joined up here. Now I'm not suggesting that you know. You, you can't right. do, but you know we, but we don't have a contact point who nurses think, us through. But they're not doing storage of data. This right. is my problem. Mm -hmm. So well, they're telling us how how we should be collecting it. That's okay, true. but so I've been asking. So when you apply for a grant, you go online and Penn State won't submit your grant until you go through this thing. And you say, "Am I doing human subjects? Am I doing animal subjects? What am I doing in my lab that could be dangerous?" They don't ask. What kind of data are you getting? What kind of data are you using? And where are you going to store it? And how much is it? And how long do you want to store it for? And for ICS, all of that is critical. So I, I, I'm just sort of sad that Don <coughs> left the room because I think this is the most important yeah. part of the conversation from your standpoint. I just layer on top of that too. There's biological samples. There's a whole lot yeah. of stuff. It, it's it's a very big and complex. I imagine very project specific. We don't have single contact points for this. Yeah. In right. all in all fairness, so. Um, Hershey, their IRB, HSPO versus ORP, <coughs> does have an HRP 598 form that touches on a lot of these points. We just don't have it here. Yeah, I do think it's better at Hershey. And so, yeah, and Hershey, yeah. because of the medical community, yeah. is way ahead yes. when we're talking about this kind of data. The problem is now, because data, right, so Hershey has got that HIPAA compliance. So when we talk about that, we're talking about protected health information. The way HIPAA and the statute is defined is you have to be a medical care provider or a business associated with a medical care provider to be subject to the HIPAA requirements. The problem is how this, the law is changing, how this is playing out is really complex, right? So the medical community here is doing a ton with that. And also from the health standpoint, there's a law professor, Matt Lawrence at Dickinson Law, who's doing a ton with Hershey and doing a ton in the health space. So I think your question though is, the problem that we're seeing is technology has evolved so rapidly that you all are accessing human data in a way that has never been possible before. And if we all talk about it, we're talking about health data, but our law doesn't regulate it as such because it wasn't collected by a medical care provider. And we got FERPA on top of that as well. Right. So, so for me it's like a blossoming problem of uh, who's, who knows what's going on, and it's kind of like, you know, I'm really glad that you're working on this. I mean, it's terrific to bring group of people together like this. I think it's a very, very complicated problem. From the researcher's point of view, I guess the sub you you're just asking, is it 20% of my research effort is being lost to this stuff, or is it 50%? So I would really think strongly pushing for this because, again, you know, this is kind of why Tom and Rachel are here, but they're also teaching these law yeah. courses. Um, and, but part of, part of that is 
it would be helpful to have a dedicated privacy council in the general counsel's office, and we do not have that. And so I think this is a conversation and a dialogue for the community, right? And and it's not, you know, that's not somebody who's going out and also trying to teach cyber law and information privacy law and doing all these other things. That's a dedicated privacy yeah, officer. Yeah, I think really great because that's somebody like Rachel who's handling the privacy stuff. I like to go to and say, how do we do this? What She's sounds like? She's patents and IP. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> See, we have to have like a Rachel and brain yeah. fusion. <laughs> we can find someone. You guys can educate someone. Yeah. How about that? We'll make it. Yeah, we have some law students here. Maybe when they get. I know. Baby <laughs> John. We've got yeah. some really great real law students who are both like very technically astute and super interested in cyber privacy. So I think yes. Thank you. Uh, one, one quick question I had going back to Ruben, Ruben's work. Uh, that's really really cool stuff. And when so I participate in a sport where I need to be able to talk and radio to someone else. I also was involved in a pretty traumatic uh, injury, so I had um, a hang glider, 300 pounds, 30 miles an hour hit me as I was launching off of a mountain. And then they had to take me to the ER, and the ER doctor was very confused, and was like, are you sure that's what happened? And I was in tears. And uh, I had a lot of different things that I was trying to coordinate, and I had to get on a plane in three hours. So it would have been really, really cool in that situation if I had that, that finite element, element modeling that could have provided that information. Um, in my other life, I also uh, scuba dive, so we have these uh, skins that we wear, it's mostly for thermal protection, but I'm wondering, and this is not very well thought out because I didn't know we'd have this really cool case study for this, but I'm wondering, is there something that we could have, like an exoskeleton that would, would have a very thin layer over me that if I had a separated shoulder, right, and they had to do an angiogram to send me on this plane to make sure that I could get back, okay, uh, that that could have been transmitted. How far out are we from something? Like, I, I know this is kind of pretty sure that exists. Yeah. Oh, it does. Yeah, I mean, I know that that uh, a lot of these sensor companies are starting to put things in different places mm -hmm. yeah. and monitor that on different type of signals, not just acceleration. So the issue though, so I also went to the um, FDA campus and um, to, we talked about mobile technologies and clinical trials. And one of the main themes there was how much can this be upheld? What does it take to have this data validated? And I guess for, in that scenario, there's other questions that come up, you know, we have a crazy insurance package on the Yushba and Letting Card Letting Association. So from a like from a like a forensic standpoint, you know, and, and up being um, being viable in court, what, it, right. what does that mean? So yeah, that, that's a great question. I don't think that's answered yet. I know the FDA is is really spinning up their whole this whole department on computational medicine. So I think that's being explored right now. How do we how do we actually get FDA approval on some of this thing stuff to actually be predictive? So right now I should be clear that the models you know we we, we like to say they're predictive as engineers. But they're not predictive in terms of medicine. I mean, we can't use them for any any, any medical diagnosis. It's not FDA approved. To be clear, none of these sensor devices are FDA approved. And the simulations aren't either. So that's that's where we hope to take it, but it's not there yet. So that's a big challenge. Um, I just want to say I'm impressed with how many times you said conception of the day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So I, I, yeah. I mean, this has been a great conversation, and we can continue it. I know we're out of time. I, I know we're all happy to sit here and chat. Um, thank you all for coming. Thanks for the folks online, for everybody. This is it's really helpful to you know keep the dialogue going, and 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 hopefully this is the start of a lot of these conversations. But to get you answers too, not just let's talk about it, and not just it depends, Tim. <laughs> <laughs>